530-532. I'd like to call this meeting of the Parks and Rec Recreation Advisory Board meeting agenda to order. Um, I'd like to, um, will the Parks and Rec Director please call the roll? Here. Present. Thank you very much. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? I'll do the motion to approve the agenda from the meetings of February 4th. Thank you very much. Is there a second? I second. Are there any objections? Seeing none, the agenda is approved. May I have approval of minutes of the February 4th, 2020-21 regular meeting? Is there a motion to approve the February 4th, 2021 minutes? Sure, I'll do the motion to approve the minutes of the February 4th, 2021 regular meeting. Thank you, may I have a second? I second. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Duarte and Ms. Dutile. At this time, I'd like to open up the floor there for scheduled comments and presentations. And it doesn't look there as if there are any. Are we online this evening? Chair Badley, we are streaming live. Okay, yes. is there anybody online? No, we're not. We do not have Zoom. It's just an outgoing live stream. Oh, okay. Thank you. I did not know that. So that brings us to action items number five. A recommendation, uh, imp uh, the rec excuse me, recommending implementation of three friends aspen beetle kill tree removal and redesign plan. Is there a motion to recommend the implementation of the three friends aspen beetle kill removal tree and redesign plan? Sure, I will recommend the implementation of the three friends aspen beetle kill tree removal and redesign plan. May I have a second? I second. Thank you very much, Ms. Dutile, for the first and for the second, Mr. Duarte. And Director Carmichael, we'd love your report. As we know, we have a few trees dying in the area from beetle kill pretty soon. Fairful Sylvatan is going to end up looking like Green River or Rock Springs, Wyoming here in a few few years, but that's actually where we're headed. But that, that being said, we've got a one area within the city's holdings, Three Friends Dog Park and Ashton, Aspen Dog Park, that's going to be removed in order to affect beetle kill eradication and fuels mitigation. It's going to lose probably 98, 96 to 98 percent of the trees in those two parks that are adjacent to each other. Because of the um, magnificent level of cutting that will happen. City administration was a um, little apprehensive about all of a sudden just clear cutting a park without um, running it by um, the various folks um, doing a little bit of a community outreach thing as well as just making sure the board was on, on board at 98%. On the, in the first graphic that's included in the packet, you can see the those aren't exactly the scale, but that's the number of trees as of about five months ago that were dead and as we know we have more by now in all areas um, so that's kind of a rendering and it's uh, one of those it's not fake news it's actually legit if anything else it's an undersell um, so that's where we're going the the next picture uh, we worked with Nancy Casey to develop a a um, kind of some likenesses some renderings so that we could make some where we're posting some signs at the park and such so people can have an idea of what it's going to look like through the phases and where we're headed with it. Uh, this first, this, the second graphic is, um, that's about what will be left uh, when we get done, which is the birch trees that are there. And those are the kind of funky birches that are really, really tall, but they don't just have like puffed up branches at the top, but it is what it is. There is some undergrowth happening. But initially, when we get done with this through the fire fuel mitigation grant, to hopefully next fall, the money will be released through the following spring, or at least over the course of the winter. That's what we're going to be looking at, only with a lot of stumps. Most of the stumps will take down to ground level. Some of them will leave actually tall, depending upon where we can, so they end up being little 
king of the mountain stuff the dogs can jump on but for the most part <laughs> this is what we're gonna um this is what we'll end up with on an interim basis the third picture provided then is kind of the reforestation plan in a, at a conceptual level it'll be a mixing we're not huge on putting a whole bunch of spruce in there um and that um though we're probably 30 years out from um, another you know whatever um the one of the keys to a healthy urban Forestry canopy is diversification, so that when Amen. you have something like the beetles come in, come in, it doesn't eradicate every species of all your trees. Um, the ash, mountain ash or ash burring, ash burring beetle devastated the ash trees in the eastern part of the United States. The eastern, the particular trees were prevalent; they were predominant. Everything else, just like our spruces now, and then you ended up with cities with no trees. So that diversification, an urban, a tree in an urban setting already has only about a 30 to 40 percent lifespan of a tree in, in the wild as it is. So trying to give them everything what's happening. And when speaking with the forester, what's kind of happened is that um, the beetle infestation is so bad now that the beetle, the, historically the beetles would only hit the stressed or old or stressed or injured trees. Now the infestation is so bad that the beetle kills the beetles are actually causing a systemic um, stress if we put on the whole stands of trees in the forest as a whole because so many trees were such a prevalent they are now indiscriminate and that's why they're starting to hit the little tiny trees that they normally would have if they hit the tiny trees which you know historically would not have done it i.e the ones below eight inches and such we're finding some with down all the way to three inches that have been hit with the beetles the upside of that is that the ones that deposit in those tiny or small trees don't live. There's not enough food in them for them to reach maturation and then fly again. But nonetheless, it's, the tree's still dead. So it's kind of like saying, yeah, my car's out of gas. My, my engine's blown. Oh, bummer, it's out of gas, too. You know, it's kind of a moot point. But um, so that's what we're looking at. So um, we're moving forward. We've got, we had uh, a volunteer through the care of the Keen. I volunteered to plant a bunch of saplings in there. But because of the nature of the park, a sapling will not survive. Uh, the dogs keep the natural grass beat down very well. We don't have to mow maintain much in there because the dogs keep it down. So sapling trees are going to have no chance so um, or very little chance. So we will be working to transplant or actually working with the, the River Center to repurpose, if you, can if you can imagine, transplant trees, but it's actually a repurposing in that we're going to, we have we, in a, all the bank river restoration projects we've done over the years, have fantastic growth at the top and actually to the point where we have some areas where it's just too dense and the whole the whole group could struggle because they're too thick so we're going to go we're going to work work with the river center permit to get a um, vegetation management permit within the riparian section to actually go in and harvest these trees which is different than cut obviously we could go in and cut them and that's that's it but we're, we're working with them because we're going to go in and actually transplant those trees from those areas that have grown over the years to the park so we have a a, a stronger base and some uh, be able to have enough numbers without breaking the bank a tree like you see um, the trees we put in Salatin Creek Park are unique specimens as far as pro contractor prices go because trees of that size to purchase are about a thousand dollars a piece I'm not sure what these smaller ones we're putting in on the right of ways come in at but you're talking at least for a decent sized tree that could survive um, and look somewhat presentable it's going to be hundred fifty to two hundred dollars each so Rather than writing the checks, we're working on harvest areas within city properties. We have some equipment that we purchased a number of years ago that allows us to go in and, and um, transplant trees basically any time we want uh, without rooting and have a high success rate. So we'll be working for that. We may have some purchasing to do, but for the most part, we're going to try to, as best we can, um, take trees that we would normally cut down. Um, and instead of killing them, um, we work them and, and move them over. We have the capacity to possibly do as much as six or eight inch calipers if we get really froggy so we can put some full size trees in there. We're kind of going to focus towards on the m small to medium where we don't have to have as many guy wires and stuff like that because the guy wires like the um, everything else they're not going to the, the having to stake them like that is not going to work really well with dogs running around so um, it's got some challenges. This is one of the, this is probably the most heavily used park other than Salatin. Well, this is the most heavily used park other than Salatin Creek, period. You cannot go there for more than 15 minutes during the day and not have at least one or two cars pull in, pull out, 
can go from there. Joel spends more time over there than I do, but even the guys when they when they've gone over there and done a project, they said that place never stops. Yeah, it is. So we got good use, good product. It's a it's a bombshell now. We got signs up now. We'll be we did start some cutting of of uh, this year trees that had to go this year. We dropped about 30, 30 of those. Um, we'll be working hopefully. We we'll get some volunteers in there this weekend to help us get it out. Our guys will be in there this week to start trimming. But over, so that's the long-term plan for that area is to almost start back to nothing, and then um, then regroup with a with a with nowhere near as many trees as in there now. In all honesty, right now both those sides of the parks are horrible parks because they have too many trees. Yeah. It's dark. It's dank. It's cold. There's no sun, and we've seen that time and time again. So Lawton Creek Park is another one we need to do down off the side of the hill when we get ready is to clear that out so more sunshine hits. Because people don't attend the dark, dank parks as well as Farnsworth and Sullivan Creek just because it's dark, it's dank. Um, we don't have, we have some stupid stuff that happens there, but not a bunch, in all honesty. There's too many dogs for the dirt bags to hang around. <laughs> um, so, um, in, in, to put it, put it bluntly, I'm pretty sure that's not politically correct, but... Um, you know, for the and the and the dog park people are, are very diligent about taking care of their space. They have um, just what the council had hoped. You know, where where they took it on, the city provided some funding. We got the grant funding, or the the basement funding, and then that group raised money, so they have that ownership. So it, it is very well taken care of. And um, you know, we can worry about the trees falling onto neighbors' pads or houses or apartments, but I'm most worried about a tree falling on Miss McGillicuddy's puppy Fifi. I don't want to have to I don't want to have to face her after that happens to her. It's just one of those. So this is what we're trying to move forward. Want to do that and again we'll have a little bit of we'll have these um, pictures posted as far as the progression. It's fairly basic that you can see where the trails and those type of things are. But basically um, we don't have any choice. Eventually we've got to clear cut it anyway. So this is helping people process what's going to happen. You know, um, Stephanie's husband was in the store the other day and the sales clerk said, please tell your wife not to cut all the trees in the dog park down. And she, and was like, she told us that, and we're like, but they're dead. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it just is what it is. So people are, people are sensitive to it, and we're trying to, trying to work through that. So, uh, do you have any questions about what we're planning? Yeah. Those uh, yeah. Um, dead beetle trees, what are we going to be doing with those, sir? Depends upon the volume. Right now we have so much volume. Initially we will, depending upon how they come out of there, we'll probably take this initial bunch to Centennial and put them in our wood pile and, um, and sell it and process it. We have in our budget a, a wood processor that should allow us to cut or buck and split up to two cords an hour. Um, it will be going into the goods there. It's about an eighteen twenty thousand dollar $20,000 item, but we even doing it by hand, we, um, we still muster eight to $10,000 worth of gross wood sales as it is. So the challenge is, is there's some laws that we used to have the 15, 16, 17, and 18 year olds that work in the booth during the early season, bundle firewood, make work, paint tables, bundle firewood. Only then we found out by federal law, you cannot employ anyone under 18 years old in the logging or forestry industry, even for the purpose of but collecting firewood. So they cannot touch that firewood if they're under 18 until after it's bundled and put in the shed, then it's retail and they can sell the product. That put a huge kink in our system because now all these kids, they're painting and that's not the best thing for a 15, 16 year old to do is painting. Um, but that's about the only task they have in menial labor. But it was, it was you know, when the times were slow, they got hours, they learned, they worked, they got to see how good they were and that type of thing. But um, the laws came down, and Jessica went all the way to the feds talking to them, and she came back, and she was madder than I was. <laughs> because it, okay, we got these 15-year-old kids have been hanging off their toes from a boat in 30-foot seas in the inlet or <laughs> the Bering Sea, and then he comes back to work for us, and he can't get on a six-inch step stool or pick up a piece of firewood. So, but it is what it is, so we're working forward, but we're confident in that. Now, the, most of the other stuff, once we get that area full, then it'll probably go to the dump. Uh, to some degree, we, we have opened up some of the, the works with one church to, to disseminate that wood and swift water for the last couple of years, but it's even more than they can handle. Because we have um, local sawmills yeah. here, you know, and yeah. with the prices of lumber going up and people trying to uh, to build right now, right. I was just thinking, you know, it would be something that we could use that our local yeah. lumbers can, can do, sell, that produces yeah. taxes, that and produces that, and that's money. 
And some of those we attended. I uh, attended a, a Bruce Bark Beetle program with the, at, with the borough did yesterday. And actually, the borough had contact from a Chinese company that wants 150 million tons of wood chips and now uh, for a cardboard factory that they'll send back us little cute COVID care packages. But maybe, uh, I'm sorry, members. But, um, but that would help out ours. It's a challenge because, like, when we, when we start working with the grant money, we have specific things with which we have to do. We, we have to process them and get them to a disposal site per contract. Because if we so could do that, that would, that would help yeah. out a lot of those local um, but ones. Some of that entrepreneurial thinking is working. It's just the mechanisms in the, in the um, governmental world are a real challenge because now we've got to put it out to bid, and then we've got to figure out this and that. And we still have a little bit of time. Uh, we, are, we are approached regularly by woodcutters wanting to help. Um, but because of liability reasons and all that type of stuff, it just doesn't work. We can't, we've th even thought about opening up the park and say, okay, these three weekends come in and cut to the public. And that doesn't work very well because now we're inviting people in to drop trees on each other. So uh, it's, I'm, not, I'm usually the one that can find a way around stuff. And when I can't, Joe steps in and, and, and helps me or vice versa. But even we're, we're having trouble spinning our way into fitting this square peg into the round hole in which we work for government. So um, anything's open on the table. If somebody came and said, I want to cut Centennial, and I'll do it for free and take all the wood, I'd say, great. Now i got to put it out to bid. Um, and so it's, it's just, it's not, I'm good at it, I think, as far as wheeling and dealing. But um, kind of like when we shut the building down last November due to COVID. You know, I met with Stephanie. I said, Stephanie, I can spin the world, but I can't spin this. I can't stand in a council member's favor, face or, and tell them, I think it's safe. Whether I went and fall personal beliefs aside, I couldn't do that. And this is some of the scenario where we're talking about trying to find a piece. Hopefully the borough may have that figured out because there has been comfort con, um, conversation about those type of things ongoing through the borough. So there may be a model put in through in cooperation with the borough that that. So it's in the works. It's just some of our properties, like, for instance, the dog park. I could, ha I could make one phone call and have that cleared in a day or two days. Um, for free, but then the mess they leave behind um, in terms of that dog park, for instance, we can't do mass quantities of eradication until the ground is frozen because with the dog, we're never going to get grass to grow in there again. The natural stuff is there, and we're never going to get caught up. Okay. So there's a, this is very nuanced what we're working forward, and this is what we're starting with. I had proposed a, a program to Stephanie um, that did the dog park as well as hired some temporary work and stuff like that, but we had a force to evaluate, and we got a, but we got about a year um, before um, the, the the lesser infected or the older trees are, have to go, and hopefully by then that grant money will come in. We had almost three hundred thousand dollars in grant money to work with that. Um, that was what we had back then. That was about a year ago. Now we have twice as many trees to do, and it's just it's going to be interesting. You know, whether or not we forego the wood sales in the park for a summer and just let people burn them all summer, I don't know. Um, in terms of that stuff, but I'm trying to figure it out. So, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Are there any other questions from the board? Seeing no one, um, I have a couple of real quick ones. Okay. You mentioned the types of trees, mm -hmm. and that was one question. And the number of trees is is about a hundred. There were three hundred in. You took three hundred out, and then there's a. You took, I mean, 30 out, and there are 300 that are dead. Are any, looks like some are alive. Is that outside the perimeter? We have, we have a, almost everything on the outside is dead. Oh, it is. Uh, to some degree, whether, mm -hmm. whether they know them or not. We know it or not. As soon as you look at them and see the holes, it's just a matter of time. I've got one in my back. i got one tree in my backyard on an acre that I found without little sparkly bits coming out of it. Um, but, it uh, but I'm still, I'm not confident. So um, in terms of the overall number, um, as far as the specific number, I don't have an exact number other than it's going to be like 98%, 96% gone. All this, essentially out of the dog park in Aspen, you can count on 98% of the streets being gone. Um, so it's going to be... Replace it with spruce? No. We're not, we're, we're, we, we, we will put some spruce in there, yeah, by all means. But it's not going to be... I mean, we could go to the Centennial right now and harvest 300 spruce saplings one or two inches in diameter and have good trees to go in there. But then if the beagles come back again in 20 years, the whole park's gone again. So we're going to try to not end up with this clear-cut aspect where we put the spruce and, and birch and, 
and some other ones, uh, the natural ones in the area, not necessarily, uh, we're not looking to, to buy trees and spend $200,000 on, on 20 trees to put in. Mitigation. Yeah. That's a that is a that covers all city properties for beetle spruce bark beetle kill on all city properties. Park could be the utility plants. Some of these trees maybe here we removed the one in front of City Hall last year. We took down the three magnificent ones in front of the visitor center the other day. And um these are just big, beautiful trees. <laughs> Even if you're not a tree hugger, you still got this thing's been there for a hundred years. You know, when we had when the forest Mitch Michaud, the forester, did the analysis for us, you know, he, he he cored some of them and he told us what happened 50 years ago just by looking at the trees, you know, so the history is in there. So we've got some whoppers and then the small ones. The, the most disheartening is that they're infecting the small ones because that's the next generation as far as how it should work in theory. Those should then proliferate, but we know they didn't do that. About ninety percent. We've had a, we have about ninety percent success rate with our transplants. Uh, we've lost a few. Um, we lost one out of um, Slotna Creek to that, and then we lost one to. Aphids that came in, all of a sudden showed up and changed the color of everything for this tree, and that was that willow that was there. And we tried and tried for a few years, but we're down to one branch of that one. So, mm -hmm. that. But for the most part, we get 90% um, success rate on those. So if there are no, if there's no further discussion, I'd like to call for the vote. Ugarte? Yes. Via? Yes. Dutile? Yes. Badla? Yes. Four yes Four votes. Four yeses, so the motion passes. And that brings us to action, action item 5B, uh, recommending administrative approval of the reservation policy for premium sites in Centennial Park. Is there a motion to recommend this administrative approval for the reservation policy for premium sites in Centennial Park Campground? Sure, I will make the motion to recommend the administrative approval of the reservation policy for premium sites in Centennial Campground. Thank you, Thank you very much, Ms. Dutile. Is there a second? I second. Thank you very much, Mr. Duarte, for seconding. Um, Mr. Carmichael, would you give us a report, please? We searched the world over and thought we found perfect, but we didn't. So we combined a bunch of different um, aspects of the reservation policy for the premium sites. We even um, we kind of dug ourselves out of a little bit of a hole by when we met with one of the software companies and then with the term premium sites. And we were trying to figure out how do we offer these sites for reservation when at a time in June when we're eighty percent empty. How do we justify? having them stay in those sites and pay more money for the reservation. Because, but the fact of the matter is, is if you want to guarantee on your sites being there and that site's available, you got to pay for it and reserve it. That's the premium. That's the right you have. During July, that's an issue. During June and August, it's probably not going to be an issue. If you're traveling with my wife or some of our friends, it's an issue because they want to know where they're staying for 100% sure. And... And they'll they'll pay the extra money. So that that is actually the first nomer. It seems like a ramble, but that's actually the, our first challenge on identifying this. It's like these are premium sites. These are by reservation only from the time we open till the time we close. Are we going to lose money by not having them occupied in June? Probably not. People will be in a different site. Can they relocate once they do that to another site? Yes, but you guaranteed your site with a reservation, so you're not going to transfer those amounts and then end up with a week and a half someplace else. You paid for a premium site. It's not transferable to another site except through fault of ours. If a tree falls in a site and it's not ready, then we'll transfer that down over. But for the most part, we tried to cover the grounds, talked with um, some of the booth people, people who worked in the booth, as well as Joel and I and Madeline, to figure out a list of 
allowances that would work with the software packages that, that we're looking at and we're seeing, and then to be able to move forward and have something manageable to some degree. I think we ended up with 23 sites in a discernible area that would be obvious that they're reservation or premium site area. They don't have any other, they're not special locations, they're not, they don't have electric, they don't have anything else. The premium is because you can make sure they're there. Will we have some manipulation by people who rent their site and they're only going to be for a week and then their buddy shows up? Yeah, it's, but we are trying, we are handling that and those are covered in there on how we handle it and move forward on those type of things uh, in terms of those. There, uh, there's an, an amount, there's a significant amount of um, carryover between this proposed um, policy and sewer, this proposed policy and the state um, where they have their online. Seward last year went to reservation only for every one of their campsites, mm -hmm. period. Um, and, um, and online payment all the way across. So um, in, in talking with Trevor, he said he's, yeah, it's gone over some ways okay, other ways not so happy. So um, in terms of that, because most of the people like to plan their, end up, a lot of people that come from Anchorage from here plan their trip on Wednesday. If mm -hmm. it's sunny on Wednesday, we can expect 20 more percent of people in our campgrounds than mm -hmm. if it's raining on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So plan it, and then by the time Friday gets around, they gotta get their stuff put together, and they're coming no matter what. Yep. You know, this is packed. We're going, honey. It'll quit raining for a few minutes tomorrow. <laughs> um, vice versa. So that's where we're at in terms of those things. But this is um, in terms of those things. So um, reservations being made for reservation sites or premium sites. Site may be reserved. So we have that. Um, must be 18 years or older to reserve a campsite. That's fairly common. Reservations may not be transferred or sublet to another party. Attempts to do so will result, result in forfeiture of the reservation. That kind of lends towards um, our existing policy so we don't have um, holding sites and those type of things. You have to be there in order to use it um, in terms of those things. Uh, reservation premium sites, patrons are required to pay the full amount due for reserved dates at the time reservation is made. You're locking it up. Um, reservations only available via online booking. Um, just we just don't have the phone power to be able to deal with with all that stuff once we get up and running. Eventually, maybe we do. Um, there you go. In event to reserve campsite will be used by one more than one camping unit as described in campground policy. Additional units will be built at non-reservation site rates. In the event the primary unit lists on reservations vacate sites before end of reservation and an additional unit remains. Fee for campsite use shall be at prime campsite nightly rate. No fund refunds will be given for any fees paid at non-reservation site nightly fee for additional units in prime campsite. So um, campsite reservation fees do not include payment for any campground fees other than camping so that we it would not be available to do our camping camp launch pass where there's a discount if you buy a pay for your boat launch and your camp, the same thing. These are just regulations of the site. Um, no amount or portion thereof paid for reservation of reservation premium sites may be transferred to use of non-reservation sites. If they want to transfer that, then they can, um, and they have four nights remaining on their reser reservation, we'll give them four nights at a different site for their reservation fee, but they're not going to get a difference in that area unless they wanted in two nights because that's part of the game. If I was there, I'd go get a reservation for two nights and then see what's available and then scam and parlay it across, but we're not going not gonna to do with that. As far as cancellations, that was a toughie trying to look at what they're doing out in the industry and we kind of got the gist of it. If you um, cancel two weeks out, refund minus, should actually the first one should, two plus weeks should be refund minus 50% 50, 50 or 15 or 60 minus 50, so, or no, okay, so you get 85% of your money back more than two weeks. You get 70% of your money back one week, six to two days out, refund minus half, and then less than two days, no refund, so in terms of those things. If that's, um, if there's any questions on that. Not the phone um, reservations will only be accepted by phone, and that goes through to the parks, and then we always have that um, message machine monitored daily. All fees are retained by the city of Soldotton if patron fails to arrive for the reservation and does not inform Soldotton Parks and Recreation of cancellation in advance, i.e. with relation to the other policy up above. And then um, no refunds due to inclement weather. Not that we ever get that, but we do. 
We used to have a sign that said no refunds due to mosquitoes or weather. <laughs> Every, sure, every effort to ensure guests receive their selected site. In this case, it, it establishes if for some reason that site is reserved, but then all of a sudden something happens and it's not available, we will comp them at a night for night basis in, a, in another site that's available. Minimum reservation is two nights, covers the weekend. And then um, right to amend reservation with relation to unlimited to natural disaster, flood, emergency maintenance, overall weather conditions, and safety. So. Um, that gives us the right to adjust what's happening based upon what happens between when they make the reservation and or and or get here. Uh, and uh, any questions? Yeah, yes. Were there any questions by any member of the board? Yeah. Ms. Detail. So, when someone reserves a campsite, how will it be? Will you have somebody there to mark it? Yes. Okay. We'll have you our have host campground host. With, uh, with the day we with the day the reservation starts. Yes. Okay. And in here it says prime campsite or premium campsite. That's the same thing. Same thing. thing. Yeah, okay. And that's where we get into the misnomers where they pick that all So does that mean it's sites. it's very specific sites that you have? There's only one section of the campground okay. that will be reserved for that'll be marked at the entrance of the loop. And so in order to get to any of those sites, we have to go past the site that you can assign to this area by reservation or by permit. And that way we'll be able to pass it along and say that's where we Did you have anything additional? Oh, Lucilla? Oh gosh, I have additional. So I, I really like that we have a policy. I, I really think it's important to have a policy. Thank you for that clarification on prem, premium or prime. Yes. Because I had a question with that too. And so I wasn't sure um, when I first read this document a few nights ago um, in that paragraph number one, um, it's a limited number, right? And there's select number? Correct, and 23. So maybe in that second sentence, if, if, if you could explain that, because I, when I first started to read this, okay. I thought because it just said proposed campground reservation policy, I thought that meant every campground, okay. I mean, excuse me, every section in the campground. Um, and and I, I don't know why there was consternation developing how to handle reservations. Maybe because it's so frustrating when people cancel. I mean, that's big when you lose that money. Um, so they didn't have any questions there. In that second paragraph, reservations may only be made for reservation sites, the definition of which is a site that may be reserved. We don't need reservations for every site in the campground, correct? Correct. So maybe that should sites. have prime reservations. Yeah, or that's actually, there too. I, I screwed up when I put this thing in there. I was supposed to change everything to reservation sites so that the, okay. it has a more clear and benign. You're so busy. You didn't, yeah, you just, yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I, I forgot to change the terms down below, So, but Joel, Joel pointed that out to me and we came to that. that, that oh, definitely okay. reservation means nothing but reservation sites. It doesn't mean it's premium by the water. It doesn't mean I thought it was right next to the bathroom. I thought it was right next to the well. It means it's a reservation site. And it has only that connotation to step away from the premium site. You have to apologize me. I was an English teacher. I'm sorry. Oh, that's fine. So, um, so in that... Um, fourth paragraph, reservations may not be transferred or sublet to another party. Attempts to do so will result in forfeiture of, of reservations. I understand that, but then when I see down below, and I'll get to that in a little while, that they can, if they're in a site with somebody, they can take over that site? Yes. Okay. And they will be charged at the premium rate? Yes. Okay. And then how, and collecting that money... Just because I want us to be successful, right. um, or you to be successful, I look at it as us. Um, is that through um, credit card only? So credit card only. And they can't, well, they, theoretically, they could cancel that. Right. But, okay, so there's no guarantee with that ever. Correct. Okay, so then you answered my question. Um, so then only if the original subletee does not show or during a time person is at the site? Right. So, okay, so all right, that makes sense. So... Mm -hmm. In number paragraph seven, the one that's underneath reservations are only available via online booking. Um, 
How many units get to be on a campsite? As many as they can fit. To be honest, we stuff them in there like cordwood, and they're happy. And they're happy to stuff in like cordwood because they want. We've got the one group that comes over the sports center. And there's eight of them, and they put all their awnings together and put a fire in the middle and have a big bash. So what does that? I have two questions, and I probably shouldn't have asked this question. What is the revenue on that then? If you, if I'm paying, you're you're losing a lot of revenue. We can get up to a hundred dollars a day on a site of this for you. So you, each one of them has to pay each oh. per vehicle per day per night. Oh, okay. So the, the oh, okay. So, so if you come in with your motorhome, and then Bob and Frida show up the next day to hang out with you and right. stay with you, they have to pay for they for their vehicle and their site for the vacation. So it's not just the person that pays, and then everybody Correct. can come along. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. I yeah. thought when you answered me, you meant okay. No, we, so. we uh, I counted one site last year, and there was three in the site, so we were getting ours was twenty five dollars a night for July. So we got seventy five dollars a night. And then they had tickets in there from dip netting over in Kenai. I think there's between the three of them, they were paying like 150 to 160 dollars a day mm -hmm. to come dip netting. Um, but they had park passes from Kenai and beach access, and then they had a boat, so then they had a boat launch they were going to be doing. So it can add up. Um, but yeah, when they when they and when they shoehorn in there, we have up the other space up at Centennial where they could be in it, but they still want to be with their parents, so they have to move out. And, and that's a point of contention because we get into the, the the definition of vehicle as well, whether it's pulled, whether it's trailered, because if a motorhome shows up with their towed car and a thing attached, then that's counted as one unit. And we often will allow, allow the unit and the one driving vehicle in that sense. Um, but then we're probably going back to that because we had some guy exercising a loophole where he tied a rope to his buddy's truck and acted like he was towing it into campsites. <laughs> Not that um, any of those things are exercise, they're just policy isn't written with respect to some of those things we've seen in the past. Maybe. <laughs> so it can be confusing. Okay, so and this, is, uh, this wasn't even a question, but it just became a question when you could put that many people on there. Is that a hazard? Is that a, if there were some fire or something, could, that, could, could the city be negligent? Probably not. Um, there was just legislation passed uh, or HB was going through that would uh, exonerate all campground owners, private campgrounds. We haven't done it for the city. We're fairly, I think we're going to, um, anytime. And we, we have a lot of dead trees and we have one road in and one road out. If anything, that would be the greatest. Um, and we've looked over the years trying to figure out an alternative route to set that to try to keep that from being an issue. But the four, four is probably the maximum that point they start running out of parking in the site they have to put everything in the site rubber in the road and at that point it's the rookie and so it's getting to be their case so that usually what they'll do is still have the site be in place and have their parcel checked and take that to the first code and still end up with the other maximum be careful here um, number nine the second one from the bottom reservations may be applied to non reservation sites I had I didn't I didn't know what that meant um, is a non-reservation actually I, I admit it may not be applied to non-reservation sites or it could be may be applied in that case what would do is we would allow that mm -hmm. but only on a night for night basis and that would not be at a prime one that would be at, that one would be at a prime one if you, can, if you reside site, site 23 okay mm -hmm. for five nights mm -hmm. And you get there, and Site 23 has got your name on it. It's ready for you. It's waiting for you. But then you decide, well, I want to go over here to 97. Can I transfer? The reservation was made and paid for for five days, so we would offer that to you at the five-day rate, but not, not at the higher, not at the um, lower rate. Just to, and we so we wouldn't take that hundred dollars and apply it to six or seven nights instead of your five or nine. On a night for night basis. I think what you get refunded is low, but I don't know what campgrounds do. I know that if you called um, a place, 
uh, six days before you were renting a house out to somebody that was very expensive, you wouldn't get anything back, you know, many places. And I know a campground's different, but so, but I, but I think you're protecting the integrity of what we do. So that underneath in the while, um, I, I think you answered this. In the event of visitors re relocated from a premium site to a non-premium site, amounts paid at the time of reservation shall not be refunded but visitor shall be provided a site exchange on a night-to-night -night basis, and that's still at the prime rate, correct? Correct. Okay, and so I like how you laid everything out, so I just had some... And actually, that addition, because that pertains, that particular insertion of the night-to-night -night was related to if we need them to move. Yeah. Whereas that other one you pointed out, in general, it provides that, it establishes what if they want to move. They may, but they're not getting a refund, and they're getting the exchange basis, so it clarified that. Thank you. Right. I'll give you a night for night basis. Night for night basis. If it's in the regular site tonight, because I'm not using their site, but it's a regular site. It's not like I'm going to be able to put someone else in it. Are we? Okay. No, that's okay. Shelly, would we need to have a, 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 fl a slight amendment to the motion in order to accept changes as suggested or no? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Ready for a vote? Ugarte? Yes. Villa? Yes. Dutile? Yes. Badla? Yes. We have all in favor who are attendants for item 5B recommending administrative approval of the reservation policy for premium sites in Centennial Park uh, Campground. That brings us to item six, reports, parks and direct recreation director, please report. I'm gonna default to Joel first for that part um, as far as part of our report regarding our hosting of the 2021 and 2022 Alaska Recreation and Parks Association Annual Conference. Some of you guys may know, but some may not know. Um, the Andrews and Joels of the, of the state get together every year for a conference. Um, it's a lot of, it's probably about 75 to 80 uh, parks employees from Nome, Fairbanks, Barrow, Juneau, Spitzkan. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a networking opportunity for us. Um, it's also kind of uh, an opportunity to see what's new and what's exciting out in the Parks and Rec field. Uh, but but the, the main part, I think, that we all get out of it is the, the collaboration to, to be able to work with our colleagues in other, in other cities. We're so spread out, um, you know, that there's only a few of us in, in these little pockets, and so it's a great opportunity to come together. Uh, we, dec we decided to host it for the next couple of years. Or we, we asked and we're given it or we or we were told I'm not sure but um, so it'll be in Saldana it's October 6th and 7th which is a uh, Wednesday Thursday and I will send out um, some more information for you guys but we definitely uh, want you guys to put that on your calendar uh, parks advisory board members uh, in in the host community typically do participate in they can participate in a few different ways. They can be sort of behind the scenes, helping with logistics. Um, they can be um, helping find like keynote speakers um, or, or other educational sessions. Um, or they can just come hang out and participate in the, in the conference itself. The conference is a pretty standard looking conference. There's, there's a keynote lunch. Um, on Wednesday, and so this will be a keynote speaker. Typically, it's a recreation 
uh, focused message. Um, inspiring uh, is, is always the goal. Um, and then on Thursday night, there will be an awards dinner that we will host at the sports center in the conference rooms. There will be, um, it's an awards banquet, and so there, there'll be awards for facility excellence, there'll be awards for new professionals, for old professionals, for, um, for people that have been in the parks world for a long time. Um, I actually got the new professional award last year, so that's somebody that's it been in the field for under five years that's showing some, you know, basically they're, they're, they're pretty engaged and they're cool and, you know, I fit that bill. And so, um, <laughs> so I'm going to lean on you guys too. I'll, I'll send out more details on what's that? October 6th and 7th of this year. So the awards is another one. Um, typically the host city doesn't dominate the awards, but it is it is an opportunity for us to highlight our local community. And so, you know, highlighting something like the Siltashi Trails organization as like, a, you know, a pillar in our community. Highlighting uh, maybe the Chamber of Commerce with the Wednesday in, in the Park program that they, that they do. Um, or highlighting a, a recreation volunteer that's, you know, been in this community for, for a long time and doing, you know, like, uh, you know, somebody that maybe um, that's been involved with the Little League for 100 years. And, and so it doesn't mean that we get to give out all the awards to locals, but it is an opportunity for us to sort of highlight our locals um, and in the bigger picture of the recreation world. So that's something I'm going to reach out to you guys too. And then both days there's there will be... 30-something educational sessions. Uh, these are hour-long sessions that, um, you know, typical conference, you get to go and hopefully, you know, you're awake during them and you're taking notes and paying attention and learning something new. Um, there'll be different tracks. There'll be some, some more program level um, tracks, you know, with marketing, um, you know, program safety, um, program, or like, Playground design, that's been uh, one that we always kind of look at, what's up and coming in the, pro, you know, the playground safety design world. Um, there will be more administrative uh, classes that, you know, deal maybe with liability, insurances, um, sort of that higher level uh, stuff that we get to deal with, COVID mitigation plans. Um, maybe Andrew can teach that one for us, and he's been making those all year. What time? COVID mitigation oh, plan. Mm -hmm. um, and then there, there'll be some field trips. We're hoping to do a playground field trip where we go out to uh, Kenai's playground and to McKiskey's playground. Um, the typical hosts for, or the sponsors for this conference are, are normally our playground manufacturers, um, including the two that we put in last year at Riverview and Aspen. Um, so that, that'll be another cool opportunity to, to go hang out with, you know, the playground manufacturing company and look at our, look at the, the local playgrounds and see what's, see what we're doing. Um, I don't know if that kind of covers it. There'll be a couple emails that I'll send out to you guys, but I wanted to make sure that you guys had it on your calendar. Um, there'll be some asks of you guys. Hopefully you can participate in some fashion. Um, you know, whether it's just behind the scenes, uh, helping out prior to the event or being at the conference and, you know, you know, you know, volunteering the whole time, like it'll be up to each individual to decide what they, they're able to offer. Or even serving on a planning committee if we, if we were mm -hmm. so chose. We have some, um, ways we have to do that. Shelly's going to cover during her report tonight regarding for advisory boards and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's an option as well. So, the only bad part is we're planning it over the summertime when life or time becomes very crucial. Mm -hmm. Well, meetings will be at 11 o'clock and we we'll normally get there before bed, so we'll stay up a little late. Anything else? Your report? Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Thank you. If there's any questions or if I missed something or if that's confusing, please let me know. So does anybody in the board have any questions? And the conference isn't huge. It's probably 65 to 85 people. But nonetheless, it's, um, it's never been in Sylvatnam before. It was in Kenai one few years and years ago, and then the model changed, and we ended up with it. So we went up to um, do a pitch for 20, um, and we had 20, but it was, that was a little bit discombobulated. So we did a bit of the virtual one, and then, but they ended up um, deciding to put it in two years. That way everybody didn't have to do it. Um, second year is easier, so um, then spread it out. So, so, but it should be a pretty good event. We also have everything from turf maintenance and hands-on early sessions that we maybe we're going to hopefully be able to attract everybody from the Kenai. I think the manager for the owner for the Kenai Golf Course was excited to come over something like that. So mm -hmm. we might have some. We'll have some attendance from borough people, school district, Kenai, us, and stuff. So should be a, a reach. It should provide some service beyond just Parks and Rec for them working with our different staff and us. Mm -hmm. so Thank you. You answered two of my questions. I wasn't sure of the number, and I wasn't sure uh, if we'd had it before. I knew that we had it in 20, but then because of the COVID. Right. So, and then people, it's mostly just Alaskans, right? But it's people from all over, too. Yeah, we have some people from, the, 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 there's a the number of vendors that come up from the lower 48 um, to set up their table and give out their little swag type of stuff. Will be virtual? No, or this is all in person. So, will you have both, or will it be are, all in person? We're planning in person. Okay, and then um, if there's anything that you'd like us to do that we can do, I'm, I'm not going to speak for the whole board, but um, I attended the one where he received his award, where Joel received his award, and it was it was virtual, but it was really well attended and pretty exciting, and I think. People who'd been before to one of those um, conferences really missed the connectivity and learning about the community. And I think learning about the community where it's being hosted is so important. So all of us maybe have connections with people who could bring in some of the, or at least suggest, not tell anybody to do anything, but just suggest. And if somebody works, maybe. And, and do you pay people if they? The keynote speaker, do they, they probably don't get paid. They do yeah. get paid. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we've got a budget for it. Um, it's pretty much a, all the money in. You know, it's it's a wash. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, there is, um, you know, we get about $10,000 in sponsorships and registration fees of people signing up. And then it costs about 80000 to put on. Because I know, <clears throat> and you know this, because you, you're out in the outdoors all the time, and a lot of people in here are, but we have such nice trails, and we have um, really beautiful beaches, and we have fantastic parks, and we, the playgrounds are better all the time. Just the little pra playground near where I live on Riverview, I have not seen so many kids in that playground. I mean, it's all the time. I used to go down there and swing when the kids weren't there. Now... I mean, I don't. I would love to, but the kids are there, and that's that's for them. And I don't have any kids to take, so uh, except for big kids. But so I I really appreciate the work that you have done to put this in place, and that you have done Andrew to put this in place as well. And I I think it's a huge opportunity for the community to to be a part of this. So um, thank you for giving us this report and. Keep us informed, Mr. Todd, please. As a new chair, I, I don't really have a report. I, um, I just thank you, I think, for nominating me when I wasn't here. Um, but uh, I, I'm excited about being on this board. The community where I live is really important to me. And I've been here for 20 years, despite the funny accent. I've uh, been in Alaska for 44, I think. I don't even know. Um, but our community is stellar, and we have a lot of diversity, and we have a lot of opportunities. So that's my report for today. And I'll open it up to the city manager report, please. There will be no city manager report tonight, and there is no public who wish to um, who are here tonight. So, 
And Mr. Ruffridge is not online either, so uh, that'll bring us right down to Parks and Rec uh, member comments. Who would like to go first? I'd just like to say thank you for letting me be on this board to try to make our city much more beautiful than it already is. So thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Dear. De yeah, I'm very grateful to be here also. I think it's a, a pretty amazing town we live in. Also, I want to agree with Eric over here, and um, yeah, I'm pretty proud to be here in this amazing town. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Dutile? Sure. Um, thank you for taking care of the three friends Aston Beetle kill problem. I'm sure that's not the only park that you guys are looking at. Um, it looks like it, the whole town has a bunch of trees that need to come down. And also, uh, best wishes on your reservation policy. I'm not sure <laughs> if you have a vendor in mind that's taking care of that, or, but um, it, that would be kind of a fun thing to do. <laughs> and that, that's it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ms. Dutile. And I'd just like to echo the sentiments of the board. Um, I think the mitigation you're doing over in the, in the Aspen Park um, is amazing, and I also think that the the reservations will bring us money, and I think, and it also provides a wonderful venue for people to really see our city and and contribute to it. So, and I thank you, Mr. Todd, for coming tonight and sharing that information. I think that's really important for us to know ahead of time. So I really appreciate that, and thank you. Mr. Carmichael, for all the work you've done on both the trees and on the reservations for the summer. So, and that is the end of my comments. It is 629, the next, and so our meeting will be adjourned as soon as I tell you that the next regular meeting in, of the Soldatna Parks and Rec Advisory Committee will, will be held on August 5th at 5.30 p.m. in the City Council Chambers, 177 North Birch Street, Soldatna, Alaska, and we will be broadcasting live as well. Is that correct? So this meeting is adjourned at 629.